Uh, the, the organizers asked us to give more of a big picture talk as opposed to a paper. So here's a picture, and on the screen it looks kind of big, so I think I'm good so far. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about the changes in the labor market in the US since 2000. And some of you might be familiar with this, but I found when I've given a picture like this in the past, people are struck by the magnitudes of changes that have occurred in hours worked, particularly for prime age um, uh, men. So what I'm showing you here is annual hours worked from the CPS from the late 70s through 2016. Um, I'm going to do men now, and I'll show you a picture or two on women in, in a few minutes. 21 to 55, with no offense to anybody in the room, is what my definition of prime age will be for today. And you know, while there is a cyclical variation in, in, in hours, um, I want you to focus on trends post-2000. Since 2000, um, hours worked by these prime age men have fallen by about 200 hours per year. Um, usually at the peak of business cycles, um, in the past we were up around 1950 annual hours, and now we're somewhere around 1780 or so. That's about a 10% decline. That's a large shift. Almost all of the decline is on the extensive margin. Um, so while we've seen unemployment rates in the U.S. come down in recent uh, periods where the unemployment rate isn't that different uh, now than it was in 2007 or 2000, the employment to population ratio for these prime age men have been fallen by uh, about five percentage points. Um, so much of the exit out of unemployment has occurred um, to out of the labor force. The patterns are even more stark for the less educated. I'm going to use less educated now as those with less than a bachelor's degree or less than 16 years of schooling, which is about 70% of the prime age male population in the US. And so for the less educated uh, prime age men, hours worked have fallen by about 220 hours since 2000, about 13%. And relative to the more educated men, again, those with a bachelor's degree or more, um, the declines were more modest, about 160 hours. But notice, it's a lot of, some of that was just undoing some of the gains that were done in the, the 80s and 90s. Relative to 1980, there's a big decline in hours for the less educated men relative to, to the more educated. The patterns are even more stark when you look at young men with less than a college degree. So now I'm cutting things by age, and I'm going to use today young being 21 to 30, and then older being uh, 31 to 55. But for young men, again, with less than a college degree, since 2000, there's been about 280 hours per week decline for these young men, um, about an 18% decline. And much of this is on the extensive margin. So what I'm going to show you here is the proportion of young and older men, again, with less than a college degree, who report working zero weeks during the prior year. And historically, in the mid-80s, that was somewhere around 8% for both groups. It rose to about 10% um, by about 2000. And for both groups, it increased throughout the 2000s before the recession, accelerated during the recession, and kind of rebounded only slightly after the end of the recession, to the point where now one in five 21 to 30-year-olds with less than a um, bachelor's degree are sitting idle for a whole year. Now, you might think some of this might be a switch to human capital. They might be going back to school. And the answer is that quantitatively, that's just a small part of the shift about maybe two percentage points of that increase from 2000 to 2016 um, could be a shift to reported schooling um, at, at that time. The patterns for women, you break out separately, mostly because there's been this huge secular increase in hours worked for women over the last century. But notice, starting in 2000, there's been a big decline in hours worked for women as well. Um, and this is the first decade over decade, aside from right around World War II, where women entered and then left, where there's been a decline in hours worked uh, for women in the, in the last hundred and so uh, years. The decline for women is about 77 hours since 2000. Um, again, most of it driven by extensive margin changes and concentrated among the less educated women. So this is just a summary slide. Um, um, now, and I'm actually going to throw out people who report being in, in school. And on the right-hand column, you see women declined since 2000. 
broken by skill in the top two patterns, so low skilled and high skilled, and then age within there. And you can see it's the less educated women who had these big declines in employment during the 2000s, where more educated women have had no declines at all, either young or, uh, young or old. So in summary, there's very large declines in annual work in the US since 2000. These declines are big um, in terms of historical uh, movements, at least in, 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 in the last 50 years or so. I, I should have mentioned this earlier. The decline for you know, less educated men from 2000 to 2016 was almost twice as big as their movements during um, the 1982 recession. So if that was what we thought was a big movement in employment, um, the trends were, were about twice that during this period. The declines are larger for men, they're larger for less educated, and they're most pronounced for young, less educated uh, men. Most of the adjustments on the extensive margin. So the question, why have the hours of prime age workers fallen so sharply during the 2000s? And what explains the heterogeneity across these groups? So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to try to highlight some of my work uh, talking about potential movements in labor demand. And then I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about movements in labor supply to try to put some context on these patterns. And throughout, I'm going to try to highlight what I think we know and what are gaps in the literature, which might be fruitful areas of uh, research going forward. So why do I want to start with labor demand? If we look at hours trends during this same time period, um, particularly for those less educated men and women, our uh, wages have actually fallen for them throughout the same time period. So some of my work with Martin and some of my work with Mark Bills and Mark Aguiar, separately we have you know, shown that even adjusting for best we can on the composition of the workforce changing over time, there's been pretty consistent decline in wages for low skilled workers during the 2000 to 2016 period. Declined before the recession, continued declining during the recession, and declined after. I mean, some of the stuff Martine and I have done kind of talked about why they didn't decline more during the recession, but in terms of continuous decline, um, it, it's been pretty uh, consistent throughout this period. And the persistent declines in both wages and hours, particularly for, for lower uh, skilled workers, consistent. Okay, with potential declines in, in, in labor demand. So what are those stories that have been out there about declining labor demand? So there are some stories by many people in this room who focused on the cyclical declines that have occurred during the 2000s, particularly associated with the, the Great Recession. And many of those papers talked about unemployment benefit extensions or increases in uncertainty or banks getting broken or um, you know general cyclical lacks of demand maybe because of housing booms and, and, and busts. Um, I'm not going to talk about those too much today because many of those papers struggle to get the persistence in the declines, you know, nine years post-recession. It could be possible, you could put in some hysteresis and get it, but it's, it's harder to do so with some of these cyclical stories. What I want to talk about a little bit more is some of the, you know, I don't know what to do with this word, but these more structural stories. What I'm going to call is more the secular declines in labor demand, maybe from declining demand for certain types of skills. And whether those skills might be in the manufacturing sector or those skills might be routine more broadly, but there is a series of papers that have come about recently trying to emphasize some of the decline in demand from skills associated with these types of sectors. I, mean, I just gave a couple of quick uh, references up here, but some of the more famous ones that you'll hear about a lot is David Otter's work on China shocks, or Darone has a new paper now he's torn with about robots. Um, but they're both kind of stories about labor demand um, as, a, as a, uh, a reason for declining employment. Now, I have papers in this literature as well, and I listed some up there. This was with, with my work with Kerwin, Kerwin Charles and Matt Nadadwigo. And I'm referencing them now not so much you know, for self-promotion, which I am not against in any sort of way, but I am <laughs> doing it more as a methodology to emphasize that is similar to those other types of papers. Now, what is the methodology that you know, I have used and David has used and Darone has used? If these papers try to exploit cross-region variation in the United States to try to, with some sort of instrument, okay, a local-based instrument, to try to tease out potential causal effects of these local shocks, 
on these um, uh, local labor markets. And the benefits of these papers is they tend to be well identified. We could quibble along the margin of whether we are isolating a pure labor demand shock or not, but for the most part, at least for my assessment, and I'm in the literature as well, but they tend to be well identified. And they tend to highlight a particular mechanism. Okay? There's a certain mechanism, maybe this local shock due to China or this local shock due to robots or this local shock to manufacturing broadly, that's kind of closer to the work I've done on, on this literature, affect local labor markets. And you know, so they document sizable correlations between these local shocks and local employment and wages that are consistent with some of the time series patterns that I showed you before. So if you take a look at my work broadly on manufacturing, I don't try to parse out how much of it's due to trade or how much of it's due to automation. I just look at manufacturing broadly. And I take a variation across regions in maybe historical industrial mix and interact that with some national trends. And you find that places like Detroit that were endowed with a lot of manufacturing industry historically compared to places like Orlando, which were not, had big declines in employments during the 2000s when aggregate manufacturing was declining. And those declines were concentrated among low-skilled workers, just like the aggregate time series patterns were. They were slightly bigger for men than they were for women, kind of like the time series patterns were. And there's still a small but modest effect on higher skilled workers, kind of like the time series patterns were. So these, there's some you know, benefits, in, at least in terms of how these cross-region variation matches with the aggregate time series patterns. But the more I've spent working in this literature, the more I started realizing that these papers are not without limits when we want to start talking about aggregate trends. And so what I want to do just for a couple of minutes is talk about two potential limits I see with this literature and that maybe we could hopefully make progress on uh, going forward. So one such limit is something that many of you have commented to me uh, many times in the past, is what can we learn from these cross-region estimates about aggregate time series patterns? In particular, quantitatively. So what do I mean by that? So most of us run regressions that aren't too different from this. David Otters, Jerome's, mine, basically uses individual data for people I, maybe from some group G, they want to look at young men differentially than uh, older men, low educated versus high educated, in some region K during some time period T, and they observe and they want to predict something about the labor market, usually changes in employment rate, maybe changes in wages, and they run that on some time dummies. If they have enough variation, maybe some region fixed effects or local fixed effects, um, and then their instrumented shock. Okay, the exposure to China, the exposure to manufacturing, the exposure to robots. And they get these coefficients, these betas on these regressions that kind of say how this shock translates to local labor market uh, um, outcomes. And again, you could throw in controls in there. So what do they often do at the end of these papers? Is they take those betas and they want to say something about the aggregate time series trend. And what do they do is they usually take that estimated beta and multiply it by some aggregate shock and then do some counterfactual of this is how important this shock is in terms of the aggregate employment trends that we observe in, uh, in, in the time series patterns. But, you know, theory tells us that these betas that we estimate from cross-region variation should be very different than the same elasticity at the aggregate to the same type of shock. And there's many ways why those elasticities in the aggregate might be very different. Oh, I gotta keep, he told me not to walk over here. Um, <coughs> so <laughs> I could have been out the door in a sec. Um, and so these uh, betas could be very different at the local level than that they would be at the same at the, at the aggregate. So let me give you just a couple of examples. Things like factor mobility. People move, firms move, goods move over, um, over space. And in these cross-region regressions, suppose that the people at the higher end of the ability distribution 
that tend to leave when things get bad in Detroit. Well, at the end, you might see hours and employment and wages falling in Detroit during this time period, uh, in response to these shocks, but it could just be a composition effect of certain types of people migrating out during that time period. You know, trade mitigates the effects of some of these shocks. What do I mean? When Detroit gets a bad shock because manufacturing declines, they stop going to Disneyland in Orlando. And that has an effect on the Orlando's local labor market. So the employment trends between Orlando and Detroit might be mitigated by the same shock. We all know that there's general equilibrium effects that policy might respond, monetary and fiscal, to aggregate shocks at the aggregate level, but maybe not to local levels. That's fine, we know that. But I also wanna think that there's these other GE effects that I think could equally be as important. Let's talk about you know, the robot shock that Darone is doing now. So places for which workers and robots are substitutes get hurt by the robot shock. So he's gonna have an instrument, he finds places that are exposed to robots um, in that sense of substitutability is going to have some effect on local labor markets. But those of us who make robots might be better off by the robot shock, and those don't get incorporated into the cross-region variation. So the fact that these elasticities at the local level might be very different than the aggregate level kind of creates a friction in how we could use this good microdata to try to explain the aggregate time series patterns, uh, which we're hopefully after explaining. So I think, you know, it might be fair, you guys might know more if, I'm, if I apologize if you're in this and I'm not aware of it, but I think there's very little work mapping these local elasticities into more structural models to handle those general equilibrium effects to kind of do counterfactuals at the aggregate level. And I think there's one gain for you know, us collectively is using the kind of models we tend to play with that deals with these general equilibrium to find a way to use these micro estimates with a little bit more structure to do some of the counterfactuals um, that we might be, might be interested in. Now, Martine and I, with Juan Espina, have tried to do that in our paper, The Aggregate Implications of Regional Business Cycles. Now, in that paper, it's all about using regional variation to try to discipline parameters for an aggregate model, but we were more interested in cyclical fluctuations and not so much these kind of structural declines in labor demand that um, I think are prominent in, 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 as an explanation for um, the declining labor market conditions in the aggregate. So I think that's one gap in the literature that we might be able to, to make progress on going forward. Okay, there's a second question that I tend to get with some of these um, papers that I've been doing about why is it that these sectoral declines in labor demand are showing up in non-employment now when we've had big sectoral shifts in the US economy in the past and we didn't have as much big movements in employment rates during those periods. So think about the transition from agriculture to manufacturing. And during those periods, it was a big shift. Of, you know, back in 1900, about you know, two out of three of us would be in the agriculture sector, maybe a little less than that. Um, and now, very few of us are in that. So why, during that sectoral shift, had we not had a big of effect uh, on employment? And I think at least there's probably plenty of explanations, but there's two that I've been thinking about uh, lately. I think one is more obvious than the other. So let me start with the more obvious one, which is that the skill substitutability, at least at the individual level, the ability to take your skills and move from sector A to B might be easier when, manufacture, or when uh, agriculture is declining and manufacturing is growing. So my dad, I imagine if he was born, or his dad was probably in uh, agriculture um, not too long ago, and then manufacturing comes along, the skills in agriculture, the skills in manufacturing might not be that different from each other. But I can't see any state of the world where my dad in this environment would have been a Starbucks barista or I would have been a greeter at Walmart in the sense that, you didn't know him, but he was not as cheery as me. Um, <laughs> and so that type of shift, though, might be uh, a little more difficult. And so Matt and Kerwin and I are trying to use these local labor market uh, variations in these shocks to try to estimate these elasticity of substitution parameters to see certain types that we could then use in our, you know, all of us in our skill mismatch type papers to try to see when there's sectoral shocks in A versus B, how does that result in 
and how does that result in movements and employment over, over time. The second one I've been thinking about is kind of new, and Greg and I have talked a little bit about this, but I don't know how to make progress on it yet, which is, is it possible now, with the increase in education we've seen over the last century or so, that the cost of skill acquisition for the marginal person is higher today than it might have been in the past. So think about now just all of us ranking ourselves in how difficult it is to acquire some skill. Okay? In shocks in the past, we're kind of at the top of the district. The people who have the easiest skill acquisition are the most likely to do it first. And now we've gone through the distribution a little bit more um, where the people on the margin might just have a, it might be harder for them to go and acquire skill than it would have been for marginal people in the past. So let me just show you one picture. And again, I don't know if that, that could be a crazy hypothesis, I have no idea. But here's a picture that Yona Rubinstein and a graduate student at Chicago, Marielle Schwartz, are, are working on. We've been looking at the, the role of cognitive, non-cognitive skills in explaining some of the um, employment trends we've seen in the last decade. So what I'm showing you here is exploiting data from the NLSY, so the National Longitudinal Survey of Use. Youth. For those who are unfamiliar, I think most of us are, there's two cohort waves. There was a cohort of young people who were like 12 to 16 in 1979 that have been followed out into the future. And then there's a new separate cohort of people in 1997 who are again 12 to 16 who are followed out into the future. And what I'm showing you now is the propensity for people in those cohorts to be working when they're age 26 to 30. So follow them out. That's as far as I could go in the 97 cohort now, is basically people are 26 to 30 and ask, what is the fraction of them that are working? And I'm cutting the data by the point they are at in the AFQT distribution. So the AFQT is the Armed Forces Qualifying Test. It's just like an IQ test. They take that when they're 12 to 16. It's like an IQ test. And you could rank people from the lower part of the debt distribution to the higher part. And I'm just going to chop people into quartiles. And then just look at this top row that the, basically if you were at the lower part of the AFQT distribution from the 1979 cohort when you're 26 to 30, that puts you in the mid 90s or so. About 80% of you worked. Okay? Now that number is about 75% for this lower part of the AFQT distribution. If you look at the other parts of the, di the, the distribution, the second, third, and fourth quartiles, the top part of the distribution, you don't see much changes over time. So the decline in employment seems to be concentrated at those at the low end of the AFQT distribution, and that holds above and beyond even for a education control. So even conditional on education, it is those at the lower part of the AFQT distribution. So this is, again, I don't know what to make of this, but it tells me that there might be something about people at the lower end of the distribution maybe not being able to adjust to the current labor market conditions and thinking about why that might be would be, at least in my mind, something that I'm, I'm thinking about going forward. OK, so that's the labor demand side of things. So I do believe that the secular decline in manufacturing and routine employment could have had an effect on the US labor market disproportionately concentrated among lower educated um, uh, workers, maybe a little bit more for men, and that could be explaining some of the aggregate time series patterns, but I think we could do better at using these cross-region estimates that I think are well identified in mapping into our, our aggregate models. So I'm gonna switch gears for a little bit and now talk about declining labor supply. And this might be a little bit more fun and crazy. So, what I've been worrying about now is what's going on with these young men. So as I showed you before, these young men, 21 to 30, had these massive declines in employment. They're not going to school. Um, they're, they're sitting idle. And if I, if I show you a couple more pieces of data, you would even find it more you know, puzzling as, as what the, uh, what's going on with these young men. So let me just tell you a little bit about each of these other bullet points. First, these declines seem to be persistent. So if I did cohort plots on hours worked using the same data I did before and then follow different cohorts over time, you could see that the young men of more recent cohorts are working less and less. Now, you might think some of that's due to the recession. But if you take a look at the most recent cohort that isn't treated by the recession, 
the 21 to 25 year olds who are entering the labor market in 2013, 14, 15, 16, they are working just as little as the cohort before them, if anything, a little bit less. So it's not like the recession treated the cohort and then we're bouncing back with newer cohorts. There's something about persistence about this, this young cohort. You don't see any differential wage patterns between the young less educated men and the older less educated men during this time period, during the 2000s. And again, if you thought it was a labor demand story, you might have thought that the bigger decline in hours might have been associated with a de bigger decline in, in, in wages. The stories about using the cross-region variation, isolating these kind of more secular declines in labor demand due to manufacturing and um, China and routine occupations, stuff I've done before, if you use this kind of variation and look what happens to young men in Detroit versus old men in Detroit, you don't see any difference. If anything, in our work, you find the old men are hit a little bit harder. In David's work, you don't see much of a difference between the two. And again, if it was these secular stories, maybe in the cross-region variation, you might think that um, you might see young men being hit more than older men, but you don't seem to see that in the cross-region variation. And these patterns are broad-based across many OECD countries um, in the sense that in many countries, young men are just working less than their older counterparts during the last decade or so. So this has got me thinking a little bit more about declining labor supply. Now, the, these young men don't receive a lot of government transfers directly. So a lot of the public transfer stories that we usually think about as labor supply as a potential effect just aren't there for, for the young men. They don't usually have any children in the household, so they're not getting the transfers from the children. They don't usually have long employment history, so it's not like they have unemployment benefits or these other types of things that they could, disability, that they could avail themselves to. But they do get a bunch of private transfers. So in Greg's work, um, he has shown that transfers from parents is important for cyclical fluctuations for these young workers. In the time series patterns, you also see big shifts in transfers um, from, young, uh, work, from parents to young workers. I'll just tell you one fact on this bullet point, um, and then I'll move on to the other stuff. But right now, if you're one of these young, non-employed men in your 20s, in 2015, 70% of them live with a parent or close relative. So that number used to be 40% conditional on not working in the 2000s. Okay, so there's been a big shift in not working, and then conditional on not working, there's been a big shift from uh, parental support during this time period. So I think that is a fruitful area to think about instead of not so much the private transfer or public transfers, but some of the private transfers that have had an effect on the labor supply of, of young men. But for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about increased valuation of leisure. And so I'm going to draw on um, my recent work for, with uh, Mark Bills and Mark Aguiar in, in Kerwin on our new paper, The Leisure Luxury and the Labor Supply of Young Men. And what do we do in that paper? We're asking whether increased technology that we've seen during the 2000s had an effect on making leisure through recreational computer activities um, more attractive, which raised the marginal value of leisure for these young men, raised their reservation wage, that might have had an effect on, on labor supply. And then conditional on whether we could estimate whether the marginal, valuation, or marginal value of leisure has changed, we want to assess whether that could be quantitatively important in actually having a labor supply effect on, on young men. So I'm going to show you a couple of pictures to start to show you what the data look like. But eventually, I'm going to give you a kind of high-level overview of our methodology we use to estimate the increases in these leisure technology. And at the heart, we're creating a leisure demand system, so a demand system in time space, how we could allocate our time across various leisure activities. That's going to draw you know, parallels to the traditional demand system we usually do in money space. And in that very, you know, the, the demand system we, we develop, we could then see if we could learn about people's marginal valuation of leisure, how much they like different leisure activities from how they allocate their time. Just like we could potentially earn, learn about relative price changes in consumption by how people allocate their expenditure. 
And I'm going to show you we could use that model with a little bit more structure to basically back out changes in the marginal valuation of leisure and then link it potentially to changes in labor supply. And you know, I like to just point out that some people think this is crazy ex ante, but it's not that different than the work we've done on home production collectively, many people in this room, on women's labor supply for a long period of time. There was some innovation we think maybe is important in the home sector that allowed women to make some substitutions away from home production times towards market work. The difference with home production and leisure is technology and time are more substitutes on the home production side where technology and time are going to be more complements on, on, on the leisure side. Okay, so you'll see the parallels as I go through. So why do you think this could be going on? Um, well, there seems to have been big innovations in computer leisure technology that has occurred over the last decade, um, mainly in the way that we could interact with each other in leisure ways much easier through this technology. So there's a whole bunch of technologies that have come along. Things like Facebook, starting around 2004, um, took off basically shortly thereafter. There's video games that are much more interactive, both you know, Sony and Microsoft and Nintendo um, all introduced consoles in the, the mid-2000s that allowed people to play online. I mean, I'm trying to tell you why. I, I, growing up, I had video games as well. I played Donkey Kong, okay, Frogger, um, Pac-Man. So <clears throat> why was it these video games potentially more have more of an effect on, on the value of leisure than those other ones? And I think some of it comes from them being much more, much more interactive. Um, and all of that ter took place right around the same time period, right prior to the recession started. All these innovations were 2004, 5, 6. Now, what that also means is I'm going to need a little bit of structure to tease out these time series patterns and these innovations from Great Recession movements more broadly. Okay. So this is data from the American Time Use Survey. Some of you have seen Mark and I use this in many papers, many two papers, or maybe too many papers in the past. Um, so the American Time Use Survey is a large nationally representative sample in the US where it asked respondents to provide a 24-hour time diary of what they did yesterday. So the way you should think about it is detailed 10 to 15 minute bins of everything you did yesterday with a time budget constraint of 24 hours. So everybody fills in 24 hours worth of, uh, worth of time. I'm showing you now, again, younger men and older men, and I'm comparing changes from the early part of the time you sample to the later part of the time you sample. And I'm going to pool together years um, just to get power when I do some stuff later on. So I'm going to compare averages in 2004, 5, 6, and 7 to averages in 2012, 13, 14, and 15. The top line is changes in market work as reported from the time diaries. And if you take a look at this young men of about 2.7 hours decline from 2004 to 2015, that's in the same ballpark as the hours declined I showed you from the CPS um, early on. That's about, you know, somewhere around uh, 150 hours per year. Again, we're starting a little, I showed you it was 200 and some hours before, but I'm starting this a little later than, than that other one. So it's in the right ballpark. But I want you to compare the top line to the bottom line which is basically all of the decline in market work is roughly showing up as an increase in leisure. All the other uses of time that Mark and I have explored for men and women in our other papers kind of net out to zero. So job search goes up a little, education goes up a little, home production goes down a little, childcare goes down a little. All of those things tend to cancel out. So the movements from market work and leisure during this time period tend to be one to one. So what is in my measure of leisure? So what am I calling leisure? I'm going to break out on the next slide five different categories to see how these categories have evolved over, um, over the 2000s. So let's start with the second one, because this is the one I'm going to focus on the most, is going to be computer usage. And the way I should think about it is recreational computer usage. So that's going to be anything we do for computers for leisure activity. You go home and do work at night on your computer, that's not in this measure. That's a separate category. You pay bills online, that's a second, separate category. So this is going to be things like you know, surfing the web and using your smartphone and doing Facebook and other social media. And for the young men, I'm going to show you on the next slide, video games and computer games is going to be the predominant use of their, their computer time. 
There's other loser categories like, you know, watching TV or movies or Netflix. We're going to have a category that's going to include any type of viewing of streaming programs regardless of the device. Could be a movie theater, could be on your iPad, etc. Socializing for these, uh, these groups, that's going to hang out with your family and friends, um, go on dates, go to parties, that kind of stuff. Other leisure is going to be a catch-all for everything else. These are going to have a lot of small categories that I'm not going to be able to get a lot of power from. These are going to include things like reading. These young men don't read a lot. Um, <laughs> exercise and sport, other types of hobbies, uh, relaxing. So those are going to be in this other category. And then we're going to use some portion, this isn't going to be that important for today, but some portion of eating, sleeping, and personal care as a leisure activity. Some parts biological, some parts uh, we're going to call um, a leisure. OK, so here's the patterns. So this is the amount of leisure time the young men of 21 to 30 are spending um, over the 2004 to 2015 period. I've already showed you just a slide before. Their leisure's gone up by about two and a half hours per week. If we decompose that leisure into what component is going up the most, I just want you to see it's almost all in, total, uh, in co recreational computer time. There hasn't been a big shift in TV or socializing or other leisure. In conditional on computer time, a lot of it is in just video game time, per se. The average man now in their 20s is spending about five hours per week on this computer activities. Now, let's cut that down by employment status. So I'm going to do the same type of thing, the trends over time for employed young men, non-employed young men, in their computer time. And let's look at the bottom, most recent period for non-employed young men. Currently now, non-employed young men on average, this is what they did yesterday. There's a lot of zeros in terms of what this did yesterday. People are spending about 10 hours per week on the computer time and six hours per week on average in video games. That is more time than they spend socializing with other people, not through computers. It is more time than they spend on job search. It is more time than they spend on education. It is more time than they spend on all other leisure activities not <laughs> in these four major ones combined. This is a big shift for these, these non-employed uh, young men. And for other groups, older men, young women, and older women, you see leisure going up for all groups but much more modest, if at all, increases in computer time. The older men, you see no shift in their time towards recreational computer. For young women, you see a modest shift, 0.7 hours per week. Again, remember the uh, young men was two, and a, two hours per week, so this is about one-third of that for the young women, and none of it in video games. Okay, there's been no increase for young women in the, in the video game portion. So the question you might ask yourself is say, okay, Eric, are people playing video games more because they got nothing else to do? Or is it something about the video game technology that has resulted in people working a little less? So how do we tease out those two stories? And so we're going to use, again, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, our leisure demand system to try to infer both mar changes in the marginal valuation of leisure and then its potential effect on labor supply. So I'm going to spend a few moments just on that leisure demand system to tell you, at least provide you the intuition. We won't get into nuts and bolts um, too much, but at least give you the intuition of how we're going to do this. So I, this is, again, a brief <laughs> overview of our model. I just wanted to put it up there mostly to set notation. So in our model that we're going to use, you think about individuals. It's a static model, getting utility over a consumption good in a vector of leisure activities. That vector of leisure activities, just that V vector there. Leisure activities are made with time as an input, H, little h. I is the number of, capitalized the number of leisure activities. H little i is the time you spend on a given leisure activity, I. These thetas are going to be how you take a unit of time and translate it into utility. Okay? These thetas or something you might pay for in the market. I'm going to get a really good flat screen TV. I'm going to get a new uh, Xbox. So you pay for these thetas. They give you some technology that you could then match with your time and turn into utility. The key things in the model, or at least what I'm going to want you to pay attention to for going forward, I'm going to assume weak separability between consumption in this leisure vector. Okay. 
and I'm going to have additive separability across my leisure goods as they enter this leisure vector. Now, from that, it's going to allow me to do, particularly the weak separability, a two-stage budgeting problem where I'm going to first choose how I allocate my leisure conditional on total leisure time in the second stage, and then go backwards and then choose in the first stage my total amount of consumption, my total amount of leisure versus market work, and then pay for this theta vector of, of, of technologies. Now, just suppose for a moment this is going to be to give you a little bit of the intuition of our procedure of how we're going to back out changes in the marginal valuation of leisure. This model is going to generate leisure angle curves. So a leisure angle curve, the way we define it, is it going to be the relationship between the time you spend on a given leisure activity as a function of total leisure time. And for now, just for simplicity, let's assume that it's approximately log linear over the range we're, we're looking at. Okay. The slope of these leisure angle curves, we're going to estimate from the microdata. So how are we going to estimate the slope of these leisure angle curves from the microdata? We're going to use that same cross-region variation that I told you about early on during the 2000s. So some places in 2000, like Nevada, had big declines in market work and big increases in leisure time relative to places like Texas. And our identifying assumption is that that variation between Texas and Nevada isn't driven by differential changes in the productivity or tastes for um, these leisure activities. So labor demand shocks. Okay? And we do a bunch of things in the paper to kind of validate that the variation between Texas and, um, and uh, Nevada during the recession looks more like labor demand shocks and not differential taste for computer technology. Okay, so when we do that, we see people in Nevada lose their job relative to people in Texas. Leisure goes up relative to people in Texas. And then we trace out how they allocate that leisure across different activities. And we find for every one percentage increase in their leisure time, using this cross-region variation, their computer time goes up by about 2%. Okay? And that gives us the slope of these leisure angle curves. Then we go back to the time series. Okay? So again, you can see what I'm doing. We're saying the cross-region is very driven, driven by maybe labor demand variations. And in the time series, it could be a combination of labor demand and labor supply. So we go back to the time series, and then we just use the time use data that I showed you before, and then figured out total leisure time for a given group like young men in some pre-period, like 2005, and see how much time they spend on video games and just fit our angle curves through that point, just in mentally. And then we ask, by 2015, when we see computer time go up, does it look like the amount of computer time has gone up is a movement along the angle curve? Or has it gone up more than we would have been predicted from these cross-region angle curves? Okay, and that is basically our procedure to whether we could see whether the increase in uh, computer time is just because people had nothing else to do or because there was some more innovation at the aggregate level in how people value computer time. And it's a movement along one of these leisure angle curves or a shift. And then we, again, that's the equation that comes out of the model that we write down. Again, these are just the slopes of the angle curves and then the time inputs. You need a normalization. I can't tell if people are playing computer times more because they like computer or because they hate something else. So we normalize everything to sleep and we have an implicit assumption that technological innovation in sleep has been zero or preferences or technology for sleep has been zero over this time period. Now with that, the ratio of these slopes of these angle curves is something like four, okay, a little less than four. Total amount of sleep time has gone up by about 2%. If people were on their angle curves, this would say we should see about an 8% increase in computer time during this period for this young man. We don't see 8%, we see something close to 50%. And the only way the model could reconcile that is with an increase in the marginal valuation of these leisure activities. So the first part of this paper, besides after showing some time use data, is just introducing this notion of a leisure demand system to back out changes in the marginal valuation of time using time use data set. Now the next part, 
eh, we got to have a little bit more leap of faith. But then we use the model and some other parameters to see how much that change of the increase in the marginal valuation of leisure could actually move the labor supply curve. And there I got to take a stance on the Frisch. I got to take a stance on whether there's, um, you know, the income effect associated with the uh, potential loss of work hours. I need to maybe have a stance on the curvature of this V function. Maybe there's some additional curvature in the model. So we do all of that in, in the paper. And I'll just give you our, at least our preferred estimates, is that we could explain maybe about 20% to 40%, 23% to 46%. Mark hates it when I round. Uh, bills. Um, so uh, uh, the decline in young hours for young, uh, the uh, decline in hours for young men between 2004 and 2015. Now, just so you can anchor this, this is about 40 percent to 80 percent of the gap between young men and old men. So what this basically means, if you take our estimates from the model, it's the young men just get a little bit closer to the old men during this time period. We don't explain all the gap. Okay, there's still other stories that are out there, maybe changes in uh, family insurance, maybe flattening of wage profiles that Mike has worked on in other stories, um, but we get closer. Now, still getting closer, there is a massive decline in hours during this time period for older men as well. So we're explaining the way we think about it is a chunk of the difference between young men and old men during, during this time period. Okay, last thing, and then I'm going to summarize, is, okay, I don't even know how I feel about this. So I'm going to show you something on happiness data. <laughs> okay. So I've never, this is the only paper we ever use this for, and I don't know why I'm apologizing right now. It's already in the slide. Um, so, but there are these happiness surveys out there from the general social survey that basically ask people, hey, how happy are you? And you have a choice to say, hey, um, very happy or pretty happy or the third category, not too happy at all. And then you could just aggregate how many people say they're pretty happy or very happy, and then take that time series trends over time. And we just thought it was interesting to note, and that's all we're doing, it's like an after dinner mint at the end of your meal, um, that young men's happiness has gone up during the 2000s, despite the employment rates falling by a lot, despite living with their parents. Um, <laughs> Where older men, and this has been work, you know, Angus uh, Deaton has some work on this, Alan Kruger has some work, older men's happiness has fallen sharply. Now, maybe they got the kids living at home, that would make me unhappy. <laughs> um, but you can see there is a difference in patterns um, o over this time period. Okay, so let me just conclude with two different statements and then, then we're done. So the first thing, I, I, I think it's interesting that technology probably has had a role on the labor market, and most of the studies myself included, have been thinking about technology's role on labor demand. And I think that's important. The decline in manufacturing or routine occupations or robots, or we talked about that, at least from the cross-region variation, there seems to be something that suggests that as a potential mechanism to explain these time series patterns. But I also think it might be interesting to think about technology's effect on labor supply, and that's kind of what we're doing in our recent uh, work. And in doing so, technology has made also leisure more attractive. And it might be doing so by raising the reservation rate, particularly for young men. I didn't show you some of the stuff in the paper. We estimate all of those angle curves separately by groups. And it's basically young men who are really having this, this taste for video games uh, more so than the young women or, or older, um, older men and women. So why does it all matter? And I think these are, the, I've said this a couple of times, but these declines have been extremely large both in medium run and long run history um, in terms of shifts of prime age workers out of, uh, out of employment. And the reasons for that, and I told some today about maybe preferences or technology, there's other people out there who might think that constraints might be a little bit more important. Um, and I think understanding the relative roles of these different stories, it definitely matters for welfare. And I think it also matters for policy initiatives. So many policies um, in many Western European and uh, the US countries, regardless of what they are, have an implicit uh, attempt to have some effect on the labor market. So in the US currently now, immigration and trade definitely have labor market undertones to them. Energy policy, supporting coal, um, definitely has a labor market undertone to them. And I think 
understanding how these policies are going to have an effect on actual employment, basically need to know both what caused the decline and how people are going to respond um, to those policies. And then I'll just come back to something I said earlier. Um, I think there's lots of work that needs to be done, but potentially collectively from people in this room who has a good understanding of both data and models to put a little bit more structure on some of the micro data so we can do these types of counterfactuals um, in, a, in a more systematic way. Um, that's all I got. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay.